Welcome back to Five Question Interviews. This month, we're talking to Connor Marks and Brad Gentile, the lead actors of the web series Mana Screwed. Thanks so much for agreeing to be on the show. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. Connor Marks plays the role of Jason in Mana Screwed and is also known for his roles in Z Nation, If There's a Hell Below, and The Gamer's Hands of Fate. His hobbies include board games, card games, and RPGs. Brett plays the role of Garrett and is also known for his roles in The Walking Dead, Captain America Civil War, and We're the Millers. His hobbies include reading and gaming. And now it's time to delve deep into the burning questions on everyone's mind. Question number one. Let's start off with Mana Screwed, the web series that recently took off in a big way in the Magic the Gathering community. The first episode is approaching 40,000 views, and no doubt its reception exceeded expectation by a long shot. What about this early success surprised you the most? Yeah, uh, I guess just the amount of folks that had such an overwhelmingly positive reaction to it. One, one of my favorite things to do was to scroll down to the thumbs up and thumbs down to see the likes and the dislikes. And uh, just the amount of dislikes, you know, it's the Internet. But the amount of people that not only viewed it, but have really liked it. And I think a lot of the uh, comments towards it have been positive mostly. And uh, to me, that's just surprising because as I said, you know, on the internet, you know, it, it, it's easy to sit behind a keyboard and thrash something as I am oft want to do. But it's also one of my hobbies is to uh, troll pretty much anything positive out there in the world and, and put a negative spin on it. So uh, the fact that uh, everybody really enjoyed what we put out there, that was overwhelmingly surprising. To sort of a project you wanted to put out there and had no idea what the reception would be? Yeah, just anytime you do any anything, any visual medium these days can be met with such, you know, harsh criticism, especially something like magic that has such a a large following and, and a very, well, can't say cult following, but I mean, they, they love their product. My mom used to say half the people are going to love you and half the people are going to hate you. And that's on a good day. So, yeah, it was just it was really surprising, the overwhelming support and joy that they found in it. What I really was surprised about, which made me feel fantastic, was I didn't know what our audience would have an appetite for. You know, our first episode came out and our first episode is very inside joke, inside joke, magic joke heavy. It's a lot of highly technical talk about cards, a lot of jokes about different interactions, jokes about different sets. You know, there's a joke like, oh, I knew that blue white would be great this time around. And so before episode two came out, I started feeling anxious that because I knew that episode two and future episodes would focus more on these characters and on their relationships and on these kind of less jokey, punny moments. There were moments of emotional gravity in future episodes, and I didn't know if our audience would have any interest or patience for that. And episode two comes out, and we learned that Jason, part of the reason he loves magic so much is because it was an escape, a distraction, a passion right after his mom died. And I was really pleased to see that seemed to resonate within the community, at least based on the comments we got on the videos. A lot of people talked about having had similar experiences, that magic has been there for them in similar ways. That storyline is semi-autobiographical. So as the season went along, it became clear to us that there was a trust and a patience from our audience, that we could go there. We could talk about these characters as people away from a card table, that we could have emotional arcs. We could take our time to sort of develop these relationships and not just make nonstop magic jokes and that the audience would remain invested. And so I was really pleased to see that. That was 100% my experience as a viewer, because I was with you guys since episode one. We got hooked in with these great little magic references, like, oh yeah, LSV said this, says right. like, the worst player in the room, and jokes about archetypes winning when really it was, you know, you got disqualified. Then we get hooked in, and then the next thing is we get sucker punched by the second episode, and we go, wow, this is actually going to be really deep. Much like there's actual other shows out there that, I'm, I'm thinking Scrubs right off the top of my head, that just brings you in with the humor and immediately just makes you cry. And <laughs> it's just the second episode, as you said, is, oh yeah, he got into it because of the, the loss of his mother, and it's so deep, and it makes everything so much more meaningful when you actually bring together the two characters that you wouldn't expect to bring together. Yeah, I don't, you know, our, our goal isn't to make our audience cry, certainly. But I think one of our goals is to be funny and human and poignant and to create a show that is about these people who love magic and not 
just caricatures of magic players because that's what I am. I think for the most part, that's what our audience is, you know, human beings leading complex lives in which magic plays a small or large part, depending on how much of a fan they are. Interestingly enough, I think you beat me to my follow-up question, <laughs> which was, it's seldom that a group of people sits together and says, let's make a web series that goes viral overnight. So I was going to ask what your original goal was going into the project. Brett, as I understand, it was basically a brainchild of yours in Austin's. What was your first inkling of an idea? Well, the brainchild was a product of me making fun of Austin as I am wont to do. I, I went out to Los Angeles to take some meetings with some agents and managers, and uh, I was staying with Austin. And it was a, it was kind of a tough time for Austin. You know, he had some roommates that were less than desirable. He wasn't doing a whole lot, and of course, I went out there, you know, full of piss and vinegar. You know, he he was just he wasn't in a real great place, and then. I think to blow off steam, he was playing magic and I had never heard of it before. And uh, I was just making fun of him constantly. You know, Austin's got a great sense of humor. He takes everything that I throw him on the chin. And we just sat around one day and we're like, yeah, this would be a great series. You know, it's a property that's, you know, not tapped in a mainstream way, but it's got a huge following. And we just sat down and, and started talking about some of our own personal experiences and how we can uh, do a show about it. What you see from Garrett on Jason is basically my real life relationship with Austin, somewhat, you know, embellished. It came out of my almost, what, 20 year relationship with Austin now. I've known him for a long time. We're very close in a sibling kind of way, an older brother kind of way. I just, I give him a healthy dose of quite often. Um, That's true. I can attest to that. Oh, yeah. Here's an average moment after a take. Austin will yell cut. He'll give a note to Brett that says like, Hey, Brett, why don't you do it like this? And Brett will respond, because that's not funny. <laughs> that's a good idea. So I've adopted that joke. I've started, my new favorite joke is telling Austin that he doesn't understand what funny is. Yeah, you're not funny, dude. You just, you don't understand funny. You just sit behind the camera and look pretty. Just, just let us do our jobs. Yeah. All right, well, <clears throat> we're going to move on to question number two. And we're actually right on the cusp of this question already. And it has to do with, well, last month when I talked to Austin, we spoke for a little bit about the role that the cast and crew played in the creative process. For both of you, what was your defining moment where you knew this was a project you really wanted to be involved in? Uh, for me, it was honestly the moment that they pitched it to me. This tacks on a little to what Brett was addressing before, which was what appealed to me about the project. Why do I want to do it? And the reason mainly was just to work with these guys again. Brett and Austin go way back. I met the two of them in the mm -hmm. summer of 2015 out in North Carolina. We shot a movie called Pink that I auditioned for and got cast in, but had not met any of the creative team before. Brett was also in that movie and Austin was directing it. I had a blast working with both of them. And we wrapped that up and then Brett became a close friend and lives out on the East Coast. And so, you know, a year went by and I was visiting when Austin's place when Brett was here in town and they pitched me, hey, let's make a series together. Uh, and it's going to be about card games, which you already love. And we're going to get to work together, the three of us. I said, F yeah. You're like, well, hold on, Hannah. We want to tell you what the project is. I said, no, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Don't it's another me. color. I don't care. Keep my best work in surprise, okay? <laughs> All right. Only give me my lines, no one else's, and I'll just make it up as I go along. Yeah. Uh, Brett, yeah. have you pretty much already answered, or was, was there something different for your answer here? I mean, it's a funny industry, man, because, uh, you know, if you sit around waiting for people to call you to come work on their stuff, you know, you're going to be sitting by the phone all the time. So people like Austin and like Connor are very industrious people. And that's the thing is like to have really good synergy and be a good storyteller, you, you have to really enjoy it. And for me, that always starts with the people you're working with first. If you're working with people you love to work with, I feel that you can make anything work. As Connor was saying, you know, working on Pink was a blast. I don't know if the movie will ever see the light of day, but uh, it was so much fun to work on. I'll tell you this. I can always tell I'm having fun when we have more outtake footage than usable footage. And that's always the case with us. It's also just a really cool opportunity to get to tell the stories that you want to tell. You know, like Brett was saying, if we sit around waiting for somebody to call, we're never going to work. And when we do, it's going to be telling somebody else's story. Which I'm excited to do. I'm an actor. That's the job. But it's also very cool to sit around at a table and say, OK, season two is coming up. What do we want to do with it? Right. Where do we want these characters to go? And having that creative agency is very exciting. It's not like we're Robert Downey Jr. status where we can sit around and, you know, pick and choose. 
you know, nobody knows who the hell we are. So we have to jump on every opportunity that is offered to us and fight tooth and nail for those. Whereas creating your own content about the subjects you love and working with people you want to work with. I think that's the finished product that you'll see and not even realize that you're seeing it, is that you're seeing a bunch of people telling a story, but they're loving every minute of it. It was a tight schedule, but everybody was whistling to work every day. Yeah. It's as important to just do something you love, even if you're not getting hired and paid to do it. That's the whole reason I do what I do as well. Yep. And that's the yeah. whole reason this podcast has existed for a good two and a half years is because we love it. So yeah. opportunities like this. Question number three, we're actually going to shift over to hobbies and interests. This is actually my first interview where I'm outnumbered by the guests. So we'll split this topic up a bit. <laughs> uh, we're going to start with Brett. We keep starting with Connor. So we're going to give you a chance here. You, you listed reading and gaming as your pursuits outside of acting. So what is your all-time absolute favorite book or series that you would 100% recommend? Oh, yeah. I don't read a lot of fiction. I read a lot of philosophy. Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Bertram Russell. I'd say one of my favorite books, nonfiction, is God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens. That guy was the modern day Socrates in my mind. Well, he's no longer with us. But if you ever want to see a guy that knows how to argue, watch this guy. He's just absolutely brilliant. And then I guess nonfiction... Oh boy, it's tough. It's been a while. I read a lot of plays. One of my favorite playwrights is Martin McDonough. Yeah. He's done films too. Uh, he's done like En Bruges, Seven Psychopaths. And then I think he's got a couple more, but he did, he wrote a play called The Pillow Man, which is the epitome of brilliance. Pillow Man is definitely a kind of capstone in this work, but. He's part of a movement in playwriting called New Brutalism. Sarah Kane is another, if I can just jump on. Sarah Kane is a playwright uh, very much. She did suicide. She did, yeah. She yeah. wrote, I think, like five plays uh, before <laughs> killing herself. And they're all just... Yeah. Um, she wrote a play called Blasted, was her first one. Phaedra's Love. Crave is another great one. Oh, yeah. Uh, she's phenomenal. You can read her plays. I mean, they're very quick and there are only a few of them, but you need like 90 minutes to read the play and then... Four hours of emotional recovery afterwards. Right. They really Crazy hit hard. Therapy. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's uh, let's tackle the topic that we're on. Then, when you read a play, there's always a different approach to reading it that everyone takes. What's the approach that you take, Brett? Do you sort of just read the text, or do you envision the ideal production? I, as an actor and a director, I, I try not to take any biases when, when I'm reading a, a new play, but I automatically almost always grasp onto one character. And then I imagine myself playing the role. So I get like super invested from a personal standpoint because I'm like, oh, yeah, I would love to play this role. And then I find myself midway through the play going, I am this character. But if it's like an all-female play, then I'm like, all right, yeah, this is great, too. Like, I would love to direct this. And then I start picturing actresses I know in the roles. And then it just, this little movie theater in my head just starts playing it out on the stage. So it's this weird thing where I, I'm a very visual person. So I, I kind of visualize it as I'm reading it. Yeah, I'm weird. <laughs> That's not weird. What would be weird is to call up your friend who plays a lead who dies and then ask her if she's okay. Yeah, that's true. That'd be weird. That'd be a little bit weird. So we're going to shift over to gaming because you listed that as a hobby. So yeah. I already kind of know the answer, but what are some of your favorite games that you've played recently? I got a PS4, so I, I, I that's most of the gaming I do. But I, I do play Magic quite often, probably three or four times a week with my roommate. But when I play uh, console games, uh, I really like the Star Wars series, the Battlefronts. So I'm waiting for, was it Battlefront 2 to come out? And yeah, then it's coming up soon. November 11th, I think. Yeah, it looks great. It looks phenomenal. Have you seen there's a chart which just shows number of vehicles in Battlefield 1 versus 2, number of yeah. playable characters, number of like different levels, and it's just astronomical. It looks stupid, right? But the also the other game I've been waiting for, I've been watching YouTube footage on it like religiously, is the Lord of the Rings Shadow. Oh, yeah. I got an email about that. Oh, my God. I played Shadow of Mordor, and... Like, you get so many hours out of that. And Shadow of War, just, I can't wait to get my hands on it. That comes out October 10th. It's like a third-person action-adventure game? Is that the style? It's like an open-world RPG, but in this one, you, like, recruit orcs to fight with you. So you get orcs and Rukai. Back in middle school, when I on a PS2, I would play the Lord of the Rings hack-and-slash games. They uh, had them 
two towers in Return of the King. You know, oh, yeah. just going through levels, button mashing. At the end of a level, you like unlock additional combos or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I love strategy games and I love RPG games. Like one of my favorite games for a while there was anything in the XCOM series, especially. I didn't XCOM. know you played XCOM. Oh my god. Have you ever played the XCOM board game? No, but I have a character in my XCOM army that is you. Really? One of the reasons I stopped playing is I got you up to, like, Major or Colonel, and you died on a mission, and I got so pissed off. Just, like, stopped playing for a while. That's hard. Yeah, it, it was it was rough, man. Of course, I... You can you can fix up anybody uh, to look like your friends and, and stuff like that. So, of course, I did that. And then I grew, like, so close to all the tunes that I had. I would restart missions and stuff. And, oh, he can't die. No, I'm not doing that. Aww. Yeah, I got really attached to you. I'm touched. Yeah. We should play the XCOM board game. It's, it's, it's a co-op game. It's, like, up to four players. And you're playing against, essentially, the computer with an app. Yeah, so you choose roles. You get one person is the squad leader. One person's the commander, one person plays the, like, engineer corps, one person plays the comms officer, yeah, and uh, yeah. there's an app that goes with it that has a timer, so you're just, like, shouting across the table, you're like, all right, squad leader, like, I need you to deploy three, and the squad leader would be like, commander, like, how many reinforcement ships can I afford? Commander's like, we only have two coins left, and everyone's just, like, trying, it's fucking phenomenal. Wow, man, you just, you went into your own personal Vietnam there, dude. That was intense. Funny that you bring up board games, Connor. Because question number four is directed at you, and I'll you said it. you enjoy board games, which is actually mm -hmm. a hobby you share with your director, Austin Herring. So what was your gateway board game? Ooh, um, uh, I mean, it's kind of, I'm a little embarrassed to say it, because it's the obvious answer. But when I was in college, my buddy Risk. Steiny, <laughs> oh, Risk would actually also be the one. But no, it was Sailors of Catan was kind of the first board game that I really got jazzed about. And then what I think it was is doing, uh, you mentioned earlier in the interview, doing the movie Gamers 3. So we filmed part of that movie at Gen Con, which uh, for listeners who don't know, Gen Con is uh, the world's largest board gaming convention. It happens over four days in August in Indianapolis. And it's just a madhouse. And it was probably one of the greatest experiences I've ever had was filming there, both as an actor, but also just experiences as a person in my life. And the game that I came away from that with was this game called Legend of the Five Rings, which is an RPG uh, and is also a CCG. And so after that, I just fell head over feet into Legend of the Five Rings. This was also, again, like Jason, when I was going through some rough stuff personally and the game just became my life and that sort of took me into the hardcore gaming world. And from there it was, you know, I mean, I could just list games forever, but I'd say technically the answer is Settlers is the first game that I got excited about. But then the first game that really like made me dive deep into the world of board gaming as its own sort of niche in the world was L5R Legend of the Five Rings. I actually had some friends at that particular event at Gen Con. No and way! They, they came back to our D and D game with all kinds of stories about the filming of that, which I had to wait like two years to actually watch. Right? And oh, it was uh, it was unbelievable. It was really one of the most meaningful, just like heart bursting out of my chest experiences I've ever had was filming there. Well, I can imagine some of those scenes where you've got the audience pretending to be the audience, you know, interest, that's a hard role for them, just cheering, and then they're cheering, like, for you while you're trying to be in character. That, that had to have been an experience. Funny story, I watched Gamer's Hands of Fate long before ever watching Man of Screwed, went back because of my gaming store, I organized a movie night once a month, and I showed my friends the Gamer's movies. We got to the third one and went, wait... Wait, that's... No, I know who that is. <laughs> oh, cool. Sometimes you recognize someone, and it's just like you're seeing them for the first time. Right. So uh, Magic the Gathering is something that you used to play a few years back, as I recall, and your role in Mana Screwed brought you back into the fold. So which format in Magic the Gathering do you most enjoy, and why is it EDH? <laughs> I see what you did there. Uh, um, yeah, so I, pl I played for a spell in sixth grade or so, like a real a real brief spell, and then uh, had lost it until we filmed again and am now totally wrapped up back again. From a strategic point of view, I enjoy the strategy of playing standard the most, where you've got card replication in decks, you've got four copies of any card, you're like designing a tight machine designed to accomplish something and you're playing against the opponents. That is way more up my alley in terms of the game itself. 
But I think just for me, it's impossible to keep up with standard from a time and energy to stay competitive, as well as mainly just the cost of staying current. So, so EDH is my is my jams. I didn't quite fall in love with EDH at first. I think because EDH is a difficult thing to get into without playing Magic. It's a hard first format to play because you've got, you know, Brad would just, we'd sit down for these games. Brad would give me a hundred card deck. I haven't seen any of the cards in it. Three or four other people have got a hundred cards each. I haven't seen any of those. It's just, it's just hundreds of different cards to try and be confronted with at once. And it's very overwhelming. But now that I've been playing for a couple months and I kind of have, you know, someone says command tower and lays down a card, I don't have to look at it and think, what is that? I know what that card does. You know, chromatic lantern, all these sort of EDH standards, the more I see them, the more smoothly a game like that can run for me. And I found some play groups that have really illuminated why EDH is so cool. You know, go over to your buddy's house on Sunday, makes a brunch, spend six, seven hours playing EDH with your friends. You know, the brunch. Are you trying to make shit about the yeah, brunch? Yeah, I believe thing? you yes. said brunch. Brunch and magic? Yeah. Do you know how many cool points you just lost? I don't know why I would lose cool points. Oh my God, brunch? You guys drink mimosas too? <laughs> you want? You don't want some delicious eggs benedict? To Is this before or after church? That's like, it's what do you after do? church, obviously. Otherwise, the game would get interrupted. Right. Okay. You're good. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I can sympathize with your issue with trying to learn how to play Magic when someone just hands you an EDH deck. I mean, I'm about to get my level one judge certification, and people walk up to me at my local store. They're like, yeah, I was playing EDH, and I played this card, and this happened. You can imagine their reaction. I'm like, I, uh, yeah, uh, sure. I have no idea what you just said. Right. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And some of the cards, you know, I, I can sympathize, man. Like, I'm very new to it, so I have to pick it up. I always feel bad. I'm like, can I, can I read that? And they're always like, yeah. And then I spend like five minutes reading it. And some of them read like Korean stereo instructions, man. It's like, <laughs> well, I don't even know what the hell this means. Uh, but you just nod, smile like, oh, yeah, that's a good card. And then you're just trying to figure out, well, when they use it, I'll know what it means. We got a game coming up and you'll see Connor just absolutely destroy me because I didn't know what his deck did until he started using it. And then I was like, oh, God. Oh, oh. Yeah, it was a little unfair. I was playing a yeah, control really deck. I don't think Brett had seen control before, and so he got a little nervous about attacking me. But I think that anyone watching that game will agree that you had the game. I got lucky. I kind of It's kind of like cheating. Yeah, you did. You, you like, like to cheat. You probably cheat at Yahtzee. Uh, <laughs> there. And then turn a dice over. Like, oh, yeah, I got my four of a kind. Question number five. As much as I try to keep these interviews relatively short, this is a question I really, really wanted to ask both of you. It's cliche to pick out some of your most notable roles, like, you know, outside of the box office hit that is Man of Screwed, and ask what it's like working with such and such actor, or what did you most enjoy about such and such gig? Now, what I wanted to ask you was twofold. So first, if you were to go back in time and stop yourself from accepting one gig, either on camera or on stage, what would it be, and what would you tell yourself? I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do anything differently. And the reason is, is because even some of the jobs that were were hard for any of the reasons, um, just because, you know, it was long hours or it was difficult role to tackle or, it, you know, I played Hamlet in grad school, man. It was difficult or, you know, working on a film with somebody who's not in the game or, or you know, might be a little uppity, which doesn't happen very often. I wouldn't change any of it because it's all learning experience. And I think we've not only lost sight of this from an artistic or a creative point of view, but I think we've lost track of this one kind of idea as a culture in our country. And that is you only grow from pain and suffering and you, you only find happiness when you're solving problems. And I know it sounds maybe even more cliche, but I, I wouldn't change a damn thing. That's a great way to look at things. I actually kind of anticipated something along those lines. Uh, Connor, don't feel pressured to give an answer at this point, but you know. No, I mean, I don't want to, look, I don't want to like cheat you out of a satisfying answer to really smear <laughs> some sexy dirt. But I, I think Brett has a great point and he makes it very eloquently. And I will add just that I, like anyone in any profession, have had shitty jobs and shitty experiences, but it's hard to imagine how the path would have evolved in a different direction had I not had that experience. I'm happy with what I'm doing and where my life is and all of my experiences, my injuries, even the negative ones, have contributed to bringing me to this point. So it's hard to cherry pick and try to sort of reimagine a past experience. 
And some, in some ways, those benefits are more obvious than others. You know, I did one really atrocious project that was miserable the whole time, and I made one of my best friends in the world from it. You know, and we've only done one season of Man of Screwed, so imagine what happens. For... You're welcome. Uh, just kidding. Uh, I mean, it's true up until the Man of Screwed joke. Uh, and then in some, in some, you know, I haven't quite been able to identify so concretely what the prize at the end of the road was, but I just have to sort of trust that it exists and that hopefully I'm I'm better for the experience, although that may not always be the case. Hopefully that is helpful to any of our listeners that are dealing with a situation like that, that you do grow in adversity. It's almost the only time that you do. Uh, as right. a musician, I can attest that's just part of the process. Uh, yeah. My follow-up question is a little more of a positive note we can end on, which is if you could go back in time and just relive a role that you've played, what would you choose? Connor, why don't you go first? Ooh. Just capture ah. the magic. Yeah, I'm going to just use this because it's on the brain, even though we've already talked about it. If I could go back to Gen Con and continue to work in that world, the gamers world, you know, it should gamers, theoretically, there's a gamers four coming. If I could be a part of gamers four and continue to interact with that fan base, that audience, that character, that'd be a fucking dream. How yeah, I you, want to point out that he's dropped more F-bombs. I haven't dropped one. I'm notorious for F-bombs. Yeah, I got a counter over here. I got a 20-sided die here from my uh, magic, and it, it's up to three. Your light, your, your f- counter is up to three. Look, I don't curse on our channel because that's the agreement that everyone has made except for you, who's made it right. a personal mission to batter that goal to shreds. Yeah. But in my personal life, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm drawing attention to Tourette's. That's what I'm doing. Like every performance is is about Tourette's awareness. We appreciate um, your your lofty goal. What role would you like to go back and just recapture the magic of? I, it's well, it's kind of funny. I started off in theater. I didn't I didn't get into film and television commercials until later. So I, I'm kind of a theater guy, and uh, it's a very different medium, of course. So. When, that, when you ask that question, immediately some of the roles I, I've done on stage, basically all of them, I want to go back and try them again, especially some of the ones in, uh, in verse. Coriolanus, I'd love to tackle that again. I'd love to tackle Hamlet again. I'm older now, and I have more experience. I've been run over, hit by the train of life a little bit more. I think I have more to offer to some of those roles. It's funny, I, I would love to go back and do the film Pink that Connor and I did <laughs> on a much larger budget on a much larger scale where we have more time to play and develop. Yeah, I'd love to go back and do them all again, but it's just like, which one would I like to go back and do the most? Probably uh, Patrick from Tenet of Inishmore. All right, that about wraps it up for this month's installment of Five Question Interviews. Connor, Brett, thanks again for joining me for such a fun oh. and insightful interview. Hey, right, thank you. Brett will return for one more video, the October live stream episode of Player 4 Podcast, which you can catch the archive on this channel once it's been uploaded. So we move on to social media. Where can our listeners go to follow both of you on social media? I'm at Connor, C-O-N-N-E-R underscore Marks, M-A-R-X, on Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, I don't even know what my handles are. I'm horrible at social media. I'm on Facebook, Brett Gentile. I think my Instagram is B-C-G, B-E-E-S-E-E-G-E-E. Twitter uh, at, I don't know, I have no idea. You are Gentile Brett. Go and follow them, and hopefully we get a season two sooner than The Gamers 4. Yeah, you will. Yeah. You will, for sure. And keep your eyes out for uh, Walking Dead Season 8. We're about to start. Oh, yeah. This has been Five Question Interviews. This is Joseph Dunlap with Player4Podcast signing off. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks, everybody.